Hi, I'm Lenny Benson. I'm a law professor at New York Law School. That school is located in Lower Manhattan, and I love what I do. I love teaching the law. Before I became a law professor, I was a lawyer, and I represented people in immigration and nationality law. Mostly, I represented large businesses, but I also took a lot of my time to assist people seeking protection under the Refugee Convention. Well, I became a law professor about 20 plus years ago now because I wanted to make systemic change. I wanted to improve the immigration system, and I wanted to improve the quality of the people assisting people, as well as the system itself. And a few years ago, I was asked by a federal agency called the Administrative Conference of the United States. You haven't heard of it. It's a very small federal agency, and its mission is to create good government. I was thrilled when I was selected to be a consultant to that federal agency. And with my researcher, my co-researcher, Russell Wheeler of the Brookings Institution, we spent nearly two years studying the immigration court system. We visited courts across the country, we interviewed judges, we talked to prosecutors, and we also interviewed lawyers who were representing individuals. One of the challenges of the research, though, was to try to hear the voices and understand the issues of the unrepresented. Because in the immigration system, which is a civil administrative law bureaucratic system, you're not entitled to a free lawyer. You're only entitled to a lawyer for your defense if you can afford one on your own. I worked on that study for nearly two years, and we produced a single 100-page report. And that report was vetted through six weeks of hearings. And then a bipartisan commission of the Administrative Conference adopted over 30 recommendations about making the immigration court system more efficient, more accurate, and most importantly, more fair. It was the last week of working on that report that I had to go down to the New York Immigration Court, and it was that week that I stepped forward. When I talk to you about Immigration Court, what do you see in your mind? What images come to you for? From the media, you might picture the border, or perhaps you're picturing the current crush of people seeking protection in Europe, or on boats in the Mediterranean. But inside the United States, there are over 250 immigration courts, and there are nearly half a million people in that system. The day that I went to visit the immigration court, it was a crowded day in the judge's courtroom. I was scheduled to have an interview with the judge, my last interview for the research. I happened to visit on a day that it was the juvenile docket. The rows of the courtroom were filled with children. But most of us have never seen this environment. You don't know anything about what it looks like because the process is private, partially to protect the privacy of the people in the system and partially because the government refuses to allow cameras in the courtroom. That day, sitting in front of the judge, was a small boy, a boy so young his feet did not touch the floor. And the judge was speaking to him very kindly. To the left was the prosecutor's table with a trained lawyer. To the right of the young boy was the translator interpreting in Spanish. And the judge was speaking kindly to him. And she said, Miguel, did any adult come with you today? And he looked down, and he looked at the prosecutor, and he looked at the translator, and he shook his head. And the judge looked at him again, and she said, Miguel, didn't an adult come with you and bring you to this building? From where I was sitting in the rows, not only could I see Miguel's beautifully, crisply cut hair and his pressed iron shirt and his brand new blue jeans, I could see his knuckles gripping the chair. And I thought, I need to step forward. And so I stepped into the aisle of the courtroom, 
And I said, Your Honor, Professor Benson, New York Law School, if I may, could I assist Miguel as a friend of the court? She visibly smiled and sighed with relief. The prosecutor nodded her head vigorously. Because what is the government to do when they have children alone in the courtroom? And so she took a brief continuance, and the interpreter and I left the courtroom with Miguel. And as I suspected, Miguel was not alone. His mother was across the street. She had brought him to the building, but she was too afraid to come in. Now, what is the story of being Miguel's assistant? Why did his mother do this? Well, his mother had left El Salvador several years before and come to work in the United States without permission. Miguel was living with his grandmother, and the grandmother one day came to him and comforted him because after school, the gangs had surrounded him and said, if you do not pay money, we know your mother's working in the United States. If you do not pay, we're going to beat you. And if we don't pay, and you don't pay after we beat you, we may kill your grandmother. Miguel was afraid for his grandmother, and he was afraid for himself. And his grandmother said, I'm too old to protect you. And the police here in our town in El Salvador can do nothing about this criminal organization. And so, listening to Miguel and his story, I picked up my phone and I did what I pledged to do in class every day, every year. Whether I'm teaching immigration law or a course on administrative law, I always look out to my students and in some day in the class I say, in your long careers as lawyers, won't you please one day accept representation of a refugee? And if you will do it, I pledge to you that I will be there for you. I will help you, I'll support you, I'll read your briefs. I picked up my phone and I called a former student in corporate law practice in a large law firm in Lower Manhattan, and I said, you always knew this day would come that I would call and ask for your help. And thank God she said yes. And today, not only does Miguel have status in the United States, but she was able to assist his mother as well, for his mother had similarly fled because of gang violence and persecution claims against her and her entire family. Well, Miguel is but one child, and I'm thrilled one life is important to make a difference. But I wanted to do more. And when I saw my 100-page report and 30 recommendations sit on a shelf in Washington, and I compared the difference I was able to make that day stepping forward, I said, I need to do more. For that year when I began in 2012, 24,000 children were apprehended at our southern border. These are not children traveling with adults. These are children without a parent or guardian with them. So why are they coming and who are they? Certainly from the media, you know the stories of the crisis in Syria and in Iraq and in Afghanistan. But on our southern border, Central America is in great turmoil. These are headlines from major media sources. And yet, I had to search to find these stories. For our media is not covering the crisis in Central America with the same degree of detail or frequency. The United Nations has estimated that Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala are in the top five most dangerous countries in the world. The top five. As one of these headlines puts it, welcome to the murder capital of the world. That was Honduras. This year, El Salvador surpassed them, with the murder rate spiking by 71% in a single year. Now, there's many reasons that we have the problems in Central America. It's not just criminal violence. It's countries that are unable to cope due to systemic corruption, poverty, but also a lack of institutions to care for the most vulnerable. And the people who are most targeted by these criminal syndicate organizations, when I say gangs, you might picture teenage boys, 
Now, you should picture sophisticated international networks. The people most targeted are children ages 10 to 14. How do they get to the United States? Well, children like Miguel largely walk or take buses through to Guatemala. Whether coming from Honduras or El Salvador, they travel through to Guatemala to the southern border of Mexico. There, they board freight trains, and they ride the top. And this is not a delightful hobo journey. Often, they're preyed upon by the same criminal syndicates. Their money is taken. They're physically beaten. They go for days without food. Some walk the entire distance of Mexico. We have interviewed youth that have spent four months walking and walked through 15 or 16 pairs of shoes. Others come in the Caribbean on rickety rafts. There are children who are coming from Haiti, and even children from as far as way of India arriving in the Gulf of Mexico and presenting themselves at our southern border. This next image is from the Border Patrol, and it shows an adult walking with two children through the desert. And at first, you might think this must be a trusted adult, perhaps a father, a grandfather, a brother. I suspect this may be a professional smuggler. For the parents in the region of Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala are desperate. And they turn to the coyote, the professional smuggler, and ask that person to deliver their children to the border. They actually arrive at the border surrendering themselves, asking for help. And there is a small subset of children where people are able to secure visas for them to enter, perhaps as a tourist, perhaps as a student, and then they're afraid to go home. And sometimes documents are used of other people. So together we have a systemically large problem in the United States of children arriving who have a right to seek protection under both international and domestic law. These numbers are overwhelming. This year, we're on target for 60,000 arrivals of undocumented, unaccompanied children. They're doing what the law requires, which is to come and ask permission to enter and to seek protection. And under the Congressional Act, the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act, Children under 18 who are unaccompanied do have the right to seek admission to the country. This is an old problem. This is a photograph of my grandmother caring for her nephews. She was raised after she came to America in the Lower East Side. She came to join an older relative, her sister, who was many years older than her, a woman she'd never met. My great-grandfather sent her out of Belarus because there were pogroms in the region that were targeting children. And he wanted her to be safe. But in 1907, Congress said, no more unaccompanied children. And my grandmother was held at Ellis Island for nearly a week and told she was going to be returned to Russia, even though her sister was willing to sponsor her. It was the action of an immigrant aid group that came to Ellis Island and assisted my aunt in making a legal argument and posting bond that got my grandmother off the island. How do we welcome the children today? We have no federal child welfare protection scheme. Normally, children's welfare is taken care of individually by every state. But when you have a mass of children arriving at our borders or entering our system, our government places them all into the immigration court. Ironically, being placed in immigration court may be a good thing because there are so many forms of relief these children qualify for. I know you cannot read the words on that screen, but take it in good faith that each one of the boxes you see is a category of immigration relief that a child might qualify for. And yet, if you don't have the training in the substance of the law, in the process of the law, in the details of the statute and regulation, the process can seem like a confusing bureaucratic web. Imagine navigating a system that makes you go to the asylum office, or a state family court, or a guardianship proceeding, and then back to immigration court, and then back out to the US Citizenship and Immigration Service, 
if you don't have a lawyer. It's impossible. So taking that step forward, I created a small law school project at first. New York Law School supported me in creating a course, and we had a handful of students we trained to do screenings at the court. And in the image, you see them conducting screenings in the courtroom. But it wasn't enough. So I began to speak and reach out to the community of lawyers in New York and across the country. Today, we are helping more than 600 children with active cases. There are 500 pro bono lawyers working with us. There are dozens of volunteer interpreters. There are dozens of college and high school students who are serving in a variety of ways. Today in the audience, there's even a fifth grader who has made community service in supporting these refugee children his passion. Without skilled advocacy, the substance of the law, the International Refugee Convention, the protection for reunification of family, the ability to seek protection in family court is frankly an illusion. There may be the promise of a protection, but it's an empty promise. Promise of protection, but it's an empty promise without a skilled advocate to assist you. So my theme is step forward when you see injustice. Perhaps for you it's not the immigration court, but some other bureaucratic process. If you are knowledgeable and skilled or willing and able, take action, reach out to others, use your skills to support and inspire people to join you. The law of immigration we all know is broken. We all know it needs reform. The immigration court, I've made it visible for you today, but there are perhaps many other areas of law or process where there's the protection of invisibility means actually the creation of injustice. I want you to think about it. What will be your situation? What will you see that makes you step forward? Join me in supporting Safe Passage Project in the work we do, or reach out and support refugee children in any other way that you can. I know it takes courage and generosity, but I know it is possible to be done. Transform lives by stepping forward. Thank you.